But thank you so much for coming tonight and joining us for Falling Water Fireside, uh, which is a conversation series that we do here in the living room uh, to carry on the Kaufman tradition of inviting leading thinkers of art, architecture, design, nature uh, into this space to have creative discussions, critical discourse. So you're in the seats of the likes of Kaufman guests like Albert Einstein, Frida Kahlo, Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, Alvar Alto, Alfred Barr, Henry Russell Hitchcock. Uh, the list can go on. So just about every mover and shaker of the modern movement was here in the living room with the Kaufmans at some point or another. So you can kind of imagine you're taking their places tonight uh, to engage with our guest speaker, um, who is Raymond Neutra. Uh, and we're honored to have you. Raymond, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's a great pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Mm. So I'm going to give you a, a brief bio of Raymond, and then we'll start the conversation. And this is not formal. It's very casual. So please feel like you can engage with a question along the way. Um, and if anything pops up that you want to comment on, please, please do so. But Dr. Raymond Neutra is the youngest son of the pioneering Austrian-American architect Richard Neutra, um, who designed that other uh, Kaufman <laughs> house uh, out in Palm Springs. Um, but you grew up in your father's seminal VDL house. Um, and you must have had a childhood where you were constantly surrounded by great architects and beautiful architecture. Uh, so we'll look forward to hearing about that. Um, and as a young man, when you were in high school, I believe you read your father's survival through design. And that inspired you to go into a career of medicine, um, public health, and epidemiology. Um, and in the 1960s, uh, your father founded the Neutra Institute for Survival Through Design, which you were very engaged with. Mm. And today you now serve as its leader. Um, and in addition to doing that, and we'll learn more about what that is, obviously, um, but in addition to doing that, you're an avid preservationist for Neutra's work and Neutra's legacy. And you're involved with iconic houses as well as one of their international ambassadors That's for the true. work that they yeah. do. Um, so we're in great company and we're honored to have Raymond with us here in the living room of Falling Water. So I'll start off the conversation just by asking you, so what was it like growing up in the VDL house in Silver Lake, California? And do, do all of you know that, that house and studio? Okay. So I knew you were going to ask me something like that. And I realized that these memories are quite vivid. Uh, but they're 80 years old. <laughs> right? um, and I'm just, just ask all of you, do you, when you think back at your childhood, does it seem like ages ago or does it seem recent? Depends. Yeah, it depends <laughs> on the memory, yeah. Ages ago or recent? Uh, for me, a lot of it seems not that long ago. Yeah, that, same with me. And when I was, let's say, 10, and my father was, let's, let's say, 1950, was only little less than 40 years since he was in the First World War, right? And yet, to me, this seemed like really ancient history. Huh. And of course, to him, it didn't. Uh, 40 years, when I think back 40 years, it doesn't seem that long to me. But the memories that I'm going to talk to you about start in the mid-1940s, which for many of you must seem like really ancient history. So. Um, my my wife Peggy Bauhaus is waving at me. Can't you you can't hear me? You have to talk louder. Uh, all right, <laughs> talk louder. Um, um, so in er, an early memory, which I talk about in my book, Cheap and Thin Neutra and Frank Lloyd Wright, is visiting Taliesin East. Uh, my my dad had been teaching at, at Bennington College, 
and uh, had been doing work in Puerto Rico and was starting back, uh, this would be 1945 or 44, 45, and my mother wrote Mr. Wright and said, we haven't seen you for a long time. I'm wondering whether I could come by with my little son Raymond and, and visit, uh, visit you again and I'll sing you my newest songs and we'll have a good time. And Wright wrote back very cordially and said, yeah, come and spend, spend a whole week uh, or as long as you want. And so I remember this old gentleman with flowing white hair and we went down to a river somewhere and I floated with water wings there and then I was playing with a little boy at Taliesin and he said don't knock over that urn there Mrs. Wright will spank you. That's, <laughs> that, that's what I you know remember that. So um, uh, the place that I grew up was a multi-household uh, and live work space. At, in the early 40s, Frank Wilkinson and his wife and little kid lived on the upper floor and he was the founder of public housing in Los Angeles. Uh, a, a spinster lady, Miss Lovey, was living in a studio apartment to one side of the office because business was really slow in the early 40s. And then we lived in another part of the house and then there were a couple of draftsmen doing work probably at that time on the, um, on the uh, Channel Heights uh, uh, housing project in, in San Pedro. So I would wander through and these gentlemen would be on their gray metal stools with their um, triangle and T-squares drawing along there and I would eavesdrop on the client conferences in the living room and I would be taken along on photo shoots with with Julius Schulman but there weren't only just architects they were because my father uh, was very interested in science so there would be scientists that would come for dinner and my mother uh, had the habit of keeping track of who had come, when, what she served them, and what songs she had sung to them. <laughs> and, and so uh, uh, on the VDL history website, you can see that uh, a digitization of, of that thing. And that people like Alvar Alto and, and Philip Johnson and, and uh, a, a whole series of, uh, of people, science, scientists, musicians, and and yeah. architects would, would come uh, for dinner. So, uh, th you know, a child can uh, react to this particular exposure either in rejection. So, for example, my father <laughs> wrote that his architecture was a rejection of the Victorian dark apartment that he lived in. Uh, they can be oblivious to it. My older autistic brother didn't take any of this on board. Um, or they can select particular things that happen. I, I came 12 years after my brother Dion and uh, apparently I was not a mistake. <laughs> uh, that uh, my father suggested that my mother and he try one more time to get a little girl who would be a companion uh, to my mother. And uh, so in some ways, that was the kind of role that I played in, in that family. And I was a, essentially an only child surrounded by adults in uh, whatever genes I happened to get from the particular spermatozoa uh, that uh, matched with the particular egg that my mother produced. I was into being a little adult yeah. and, and interested in all in noticing all these different characters. So, well, I'm I'm sure you've heard you bear a striking striking resemblance to your to your father. So you got a little bit of those genes too. That's true. Got the same nose. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. Uh, was there any particular visitor that you vividly remember that had a particular impact on you? Well, 
the thing that you pick up is the emotional enthusiasm that yeah. that uh, people have for their work. I have particular fond feelings for Ray Eames, who's you know they were good friends and warm affirmative kind of person that, that I knew into my young adulthood. And um, Rafael Soriano was mm. another person like that. Uh, that um, um, and my kids remember Rafael uh, as, a, uh, as a character. Um, there, uh, uh, so the, pl the place that I grew up in is c called the VDL Studio and Residences. And VDL was van der Leo, who, who was a Dutch industrialist um, who was a big promoter of early Dutch modernism. And he also was a theosophist and a follower of the uh, Indian philosopher Krishnamurti. And probably through him, a woman named Rosalind Rajagopal, Rajagopal uh, built um, an addition onto one of her houses in in, in Hollywood, and at a certain point, when I took an unauthorized uh, three o'clock in the morning grunion hunt uh, um, uh, adventure with my buddies and in, in, in a six pack of beer at age fourteen, <laughs> uh, I got sent off to a school in Ojai founded by Rosalind Rajagopal, and and the Theosophist. So. And that's where I met my wife, Peggy Bauhaus. We've known each other since we were 15 years old. Although we didn't get married, we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend, but have been friends for all that period of time and got together after our spouses died. So um, that was an important uh, influence. The, 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 that this connection through Case van der Leo to this school meant that uh, I did have a girlfriend. My first girlfriend was Alan Watts's uh, daughter, Alan Watts, the Zen pr promoter of Zen Buddhism. Uh, um, we heard Krishnamurti talk. Aldous Huxley came and talked to us. My English teacher, Robert Aitken, became Robert Aitken Roshi and spent a had already spent two years in the Zen monastery. So um, that gave an interest in, in a spiritual perspective on life that I didn't get from my core family. My father was very tolerant, but he, he was a thoroughgoing materialist. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was a little bit more inclined in that, in that direction. Um, and, and that related to being aware of, of uh, what your intention uh, is in what, what you do and not becoming so um, captivated by your material life and also your career ego involvement. So, um, so there, were, there was this wide range of very engaged people to be around. And um, so then there was the expectation that you would be in, engaged <laughs> also and that, that uh, you would be engaged for the public benefit. Sure. And so when I read Survival Through Design, I was very attracted by the uh, focus on, on design for a wide range of clientele, not just uh, private clients mm -hmm. like the Kaufmans, uh, but in the design of hospitals and schools and apartments and low-cost housing and communities and what have you. And that you would pay attention not only to the conscious feelings that uh, would be engendered by a wonderful space like this, but that there were physiological impacts that you weren't aware of, and that meant that you had to be, uh, you had a special duty of responsibility in, in what you were doing. It's, it's uh, 
there's a difference between Frank Lloyd Wright and Dior um, uh, or Versace, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because these are enduring places. And, uh, there millions of people have come through this place and been moved by it. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've also been affected in ways that they don't know, particularly people that mm -hmm. lived here mm -hmm. um, day in, day out. So um, I decided that I was going to be a neuroscience researcher and that I would go into medicine. And so um, I prepared for that in, at college and then I went off to McGill Medical School and um, I thought that I would be a laboratory scientist until I had a few internships and spilled too many test tubes of reagents <laughs> and things and it became clear that that wasn't the thing that I was going to do. And, and, and then I thought, well, maybe I'll be a medical anthropologist um, and understand um, that side of, of, uh, of design and, and, and medical systems for people in different cultures. So um, I, I was telling um, Justin and Mark and William last night that uh, I went and worked on the Navajo Reservation for a summer uh, in a study of hysterics and epileptics and what kind of Navajo diagnosis, this is on the Navajo Reservation, what kind of Nav uh, Navajo diagnosis, what kind of uh, Navajo ceremonial treatment they had. And, um, and then I discovered that instead of going to Vietnam, I could serve as a uh, U.S. Public Health Service officer taking care of Navajo Indians and so came back and did that and uh, then I was sent off to a course in tuberculosis control and as part of part of this was administrative and how to run a program and so forth but one of the days was devoted to epidemiology and uh, in the morning we read and discussed a paper in which people in Bangladesh were randomized, tuberculosis patients in Bangladesh, were randomized between being sent off to a sanitarium or staying at home and having a barefoot doctor visit them every day and supervise them taking their anti-tuberculosis pills. Hmm. And then they looked at the survival rate, the cure rate, the acceptability and the cost. And as you would expect, the barefoot doctors won out on every co mm -hmm. cost. And I said, mm -hmm. this is what I want to do. And why? Uh, because similarly to what I'd kind of grown up with, there was a, a broad intention uh, to serve a wide group of people, to be evidence influenced in what you did, what really worked, what didn't work. Uh, there was also some notion of just, just as Mr. Wright and my father had to overcome habits of people <laughs> of, of what they were used to, to doing. Uh, similarly in public health, you have to do that as well. Get these Bangladeshis used to the fact that someone's going to come by with and get them to take pills or get people to stop smoking or uh, get people to stop using ketamine or uh, that, that we're continuously going against the grain. So I was kind of used to that too. So it just matched over uh, very much. And uh, so that's how I got into a career in epidemiology. I went back and got a master's and doctorate in epidemiology at Harvard. Spent three years in, in South America doing my doctoral thesis, came back and taught at Harvard, at UCLA. And then almost by a, a, um, an accident, I gave up a, a, a tenured position at UCLA and went and worked at the uh, California Department of Public Health in environmental uh, epidemiology. And discovered that that really fit my personality much better because it was like an emergency room of interesting events. Everything from chemical spills and communities that were worried that they were going to get cancer from that to people that were worried about 
uh, magnetic fields from power lines, uh, um, trying to figure out how a, a, um, uh, a pesticide had gotten into watermelons on the 4th of uh, July and made people sick. And it was one thing after another, and it was very much embedded in a number of different communities around California. So I did that for 30 years. Hmm. So um, that gives you an idea of the trajectory of my uh, career that it seems not much related to architecture, but it was environmental and occupational environments that Absolutely. That, that I was studying. And I learned something that my father didn't seem to understand with his enthusiasm for evidence-based, um, using evidence about what's good for you to uh, influence your design. Because um, there are some facts that are inconvenient to some people, right? Um, and uh, in the work that I was doing, um, we got kicked in the butt around that <laughs> issue a lot because if if you thought that the railroad car that that dumped a chemical into the Sacramento River and sterilized 40 miles of the river, uh, that that was a bad thing, and that uh, you could studied the community and showed that there were some bad results from that. The people that ran the motels in Dunsmuir, California, that was not a welcome piece of news because then people would be afraid that there was still something bad there. And, and, and yet it was very welcome news to all the chemically sensitive people in San Francisco that had moved to Dunsmuir just a year before uh, the train fell into the river. So we learned that people were going to be distrustful at, at the get-go of what we were going to do because the chemically sensitive people were sure that we were craven bureaucrats and that we would be influenced by the motel people to suppress the facts about their thing. And the motel people thought we were communists from Berkeley and were going to um, alarm everybody to no good reason. And so we got in the habit of having, as part of our team, social workers who uh, would figure out who was who in the community and say, look, how can we set this thing up so that you're assured that these scientists are on the up and up? And uh, what are you most worried about? Well, we're worried about how this is going to be spun out on, uh, you know, uh, who's going to get to spin these results? And, and how are we going to make sure that all the stakeholders hear about this before they hear about it mm -hmm. by the evening news where it's all blown out of proportion to get more viewers and so forth. So, and we saw this in the COVID epidemic, didn't we? Where people said, well, we'll just go with the facts. But the facts about risks in schools for tens of thousands of elderly teachers uh, is one thing, but the facts about the social consequences of closing down the schools on the academic future and the emotional thing of millions of kids is another thing. And, and then there are people who ideologically think that, you know, these teachers, they just have to do, you know, suck it up and and do the right thing, and the, and the teachers' union are saying, well, wait a second, no one's going to force us to take a big risk. So they're ideological, there's uh, uh, economic interest, all of these, there are many different people that have a different point of view. And this is true in architecture as well. And I, I like to give the example of my father's love of floor-to-ceiling sliding glass doors. Now, sli sliding glass doors that are floor to ceiling are very beautiful. And there's benefit from natural light that comes in that triggers your circadian rhythm, and that, that's good. But then there's a small probability that you could walk through that door and exsanguinate, <laughs> right? And in fact, 
My father bumped into the door twice during Shulman shoots, but he continued <laughs> to use these doors because for him and, and his clients... The risk was worth the, the benefit. The, the, the risk is worth the benefit. Yeah. But this is... There's no right answer to this. You could he never did have a client like that said, don't put any of those doors in. Uh, but they could have, and, and he would have responded. So, um, Raymond, I want to go back to influence uh, yeah. early on in life, just real quick, because your house was also filled with music from your mother, and your mother was a trained cellist. And singer. And singer. Yeah. And of course, Frank Lloyd Wright was heavily influenced by music, calling his buildings edifices of sound, symphonies, uh -huh. uh, compositions of, of melody and color. And um, So was your father at all influenced by your mother's music? Were you influenced by for that sure, at all? For sure I was. Um, and my father appreciated it and was supportive of uh, of my mother in, in that in that regard, um, and so they would be when he gave lectures. Oftentimes she would play beforehand, and and she had an unusual talent uh, that she played the cello and sang at the same time, like a guitarist would. Except that this is a little bit different, uh, and in fact. Um, um, with my dad's help, she cut a record in the in the, s the late fifties uh, of her both piano songs, and she would sing things like Schubert and Brahms and so forth, and then Swiss Swiss uh, folk songs. And she would come to that boarding school, and Peggy remembers her coming and giving concerts there. And uh, about a year ago. My oldest son on on uh, Craigslist discovered a copy of that record that had never been opened. Uh, ooh, wow. And uh, one of the Neutra uh, clients is a music uh, producer, and so he digitized that. So we have that record on the Neutra.org website if you <laughs> go and listen to yeah. it so you can hear what she sounded like. And... Uh, she was my dad's uh, executive assistant and sounding board, and uh, uh, and so she was kept very busy. Um, but Sunday morning was her time, and he was not to bother her on Sunday morning. So uh, Sunday morning, for about three hours, she went down to the piano. And I would, as a kid, would go and sit under the piano and read Dick Tracy in the comics while she sang uh, Brahms and Schubert and Caldara. And, uh, and, and then she pulled out her cello and practiced and sang that. So um, uh, it was, uh, you know, formative and, and, and shaped my taste in, in music. And that was a relationship with Frank Lloyd Wright because... Uh, my father had been trying to work with Wright and was writing th through Rudolf Schindler and directly to Wright, trying to get a job to come to Japan, uh, and um, it, it never quite worked out. And, and then he came to Chicago and worked for Hollybird and, and Roach, and uh, he, he had been trying to get Louis Sullivan's Kindergarten Chats published in Germany and had a manuscript which he brought back to Sullivan. And then two weeks later, Sullivan died. And he went to the funeral and there was Frank Lloyd Wright. And, and, and then they were face to face and Wright said, well, why don't you come up and, and um, visit and let's see that maybe we can work something out. Now it happened that my mother uh, had stayed behind to deliver my oldest brother. And so my father had been there for about a year. At Taliesin? Uh, no, not oh. at Taliesin yet. He was okay. working in Chicago. Okay. And uh, so my mother came to the boat. This gives you an idea of her priority. Mm -hmm. Came to the boat in Bremerhaven w with her mother and my 
baby brother Frank and started to go on board and they said, well, where's the kid's, where's the, where's the kid's passport? And she was so naive that she thought, well, babies just go along. And so there she was, she had a ticket and she was, my mother, my dad had sent her the money to get a ticket to come over. So she turned around to my grandmother and said, can you take him? We'll, we'll figure out how to get a passport for him later. And she hopped on board and, and with her cello. <laughs> Not right? the baby. Not the baby. So then uh, she got to Ellis Island and um, they said, well, uh, where's your musician's license? And she said, well, I'll play for you. And she said, no, no, you've got to have a license to get, you know, get in as a musician. So you have to go to Ellis Island. And this is Friday, and the, the, uh, the judge will see you on, on Monday. And so there she was in Ellis Island, um, and she writes, uh, in my book, I do, you know, I, I, uh, I quote this long letter describing what it was like to be in, in this Ellis Island. And then uh, my father had come out from Chicago, and, and he, of course he couldn't see her, but then on, on Monday they were there, and he explained that, you know, he was gainfully employed and so forth. And uh, the judge, um, said, well, I think you'll be a good citizen and let her come, come in. And then they hopped on the train and went straight from Ellis Island to Taliesin East. So you can imagine <laughs> what an impression. And so there are long letters describing what that experience was like and, and, um, um, and my mother uh, my mother played for for Wright, and then he invited them to come back, and 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 they were there for about three or four months. And uh, music was a big deal. There were um, other architects there who were violinists. My mother would play the cello, and someone else was playing the piano. And this was at, at Wright's kind of a very low point in his life. Old Gavana came just at that time and my mother played for her while she danced in front of the fire. And, uh, and so there was a very fond relationship between them, mostly between Your mom. my mom yeah. and Wright. Yeah. And she, of course, they were um, both very grateful for, for Wright's hospitality to them and he helped them get Frank, my brother Frank over, my grandmother came with Frank and spent time there. And so uh, in this book, Cheap and Thin, Neutra and Frank Lloyd Wright, there's that whole correspondence that goes for 40 years. Um, well, Wright would later criticize your father, calling the Level Heath ha Health House cheap and thin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he'd call the Kaufman House a nasty cliche. Uh -huh. So how did this kind of mutual respect and admiration relationship and teacher-student, or maybe it was never teacher-student, just almost equals. How did that kind of evolve and get to a point where they were well, not maybe on the best of terms? Well, I think the not on best of terms is more from Wright's, from Wright's point, perspective, point of yeah. view. Uh, and He didn't like competition. He, yeah, and, and he didn't like the fact that, that my father didn't acknowledge enough the influence, and clearly it was a tremendous influence. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, my parents kept writing pleasant letters to write, and he would answer always, but there was always a little bar. Little jab. A little <laughs> jab. Um, but, you know, in 19. Uh, 44, they, my father came along on that trip and they seemed to have a nice time together. Um, so uh, I have some memories of also the Kaufmans. Um, um, I, I had my 12th birthday party at the Kaufman house 
and we figured out it must have been the second. Must have been the second wife, second, Grace Stoops. Uh, uh, yeah. Grace Stoops, who was there. But I remember an, an earlier visit with with Lillian, and and being impressed that that um, Edgar was wearing sort of long baggy shorts, mm -hmm. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Kaufman was sliding her hand up his thigh, and that <laughs> that that uh, underneath. The, Pants and that that uh, uh, that stuck in my. I was probably was about ten. <laughs> and then, what kind of party? Was well, they, they, we were just there, and it seemed to me that the owner of the May Company was yeah. was visiting that weekend uh -huh. also. This is at the Palm Springs at, House. At the Palm uh -huh. Springs House, and then later, uh, Grace, I was swimming in the pool, and and she was kind of praising how great I was as, as a swimmer, which I thought was a little patronizing. <laughs> I didn't think it was totally um, genuine, anyway. Um, that, that's my... And, and also, I kind of sensed that Mr. Kaufman didn't pay the kind of deference to my father mm. that other uh, clients um, tended to do. And, and both Lillian and Edgar were heavily involved in the commission, I mean, Edgar Sr. would call um, Thaddeus Longstreth, who was working with your father, as right. in a, a young apprentice on the job, and they'd spend hours on the phone talking over details. Yes, Thaddeus's job was to deal with Mr. Kaufman, to deal with was Mr. Fil filled with ideas, and he had a lot of good ideas. It was a lot of um, um, uh, it was a lot of discussion about illumination at night uh -huh. and how to make that work. And, and the seamless corners. And the seamless corners, corners, which of course I see here in these uh -huh. windows too, that, that he, he's on, on the, first, uh, uh, the first visit of Mr. Kaufman to react to the preliminary proposals, there's a note, um, a, a client wants to have uh, sliding doors with no styles of Herculite glass meeting at the corner. And, and so that's what he got. But mm -hmm. not, there's styles to it, but, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. which I think he only did one other time in another, mm -hmm. another house. And there's great stories of Edgar Kaufman showing up in overalls and supervising the job site. And, and, and apparently there was a set to around the uh, around the mason that uh, um, apparently Mr. Kaufman thought he was drunk and, and should be fired. <laughs> and my father finally finally put his foot down. He said, "If he goes, then I go." And, and so Kaufman backed off. And, um, you all know the iconic Julia Shulman photo of the Kaufman house, right? Which yeah, has yeah. Lillian Kaufman reclined. Mm -hmm. by the pool I didn't know that was the and it was such a she was kind of placed there to block one of the pool lights that was <laughs> interfering with the long exposure of the camera and then because it was such a long exposure she always had Dotsons so you can if you look closely you can see the wet paw prints of the Dotsons mm -hmm. running around oh uh, really I've background. never noticed that yeah um, That's great. <laughs> but did did Julius did your dad or interactions with Julius Schulman did he ever talk about that iconic photo with you? Well, there's a movie uh, oh, about sure. Julius Visual where he says that uh, my father didn't want him to take that shot and, and Julius knew that it was sunset and it was going to be good and, and, and went in and, and took it. Um, my experience of uh, the photo shoots was that there was a lot of discussion and, the, and my father had a lot of uh, influence about exactly where the thing was going to be. And uh, in his movie, Julia said, yeah, but then I went and did what I want to do. But that wasn't my, my experience of the thing. I, I think as time went on, Julius became more and more restive of this um, um, interference or, or direction. But he always went along with Julius. Um, Were you ever along on the photo Yeah, shoots? it was my job to push the furniture of the owners out and put a <laughs> nitro Were you ever holding a on, twig? Just I, as uh, so holding the twig was another, <laughs> uh, was another job. Yeah. Um, can I ask 
Yeah, um, please, William. One of the things that I understand from Julius was really that his career was launched working with your father and taking pictures of your father's projects. So, the Coon has one, right? Yeah, yeah. and um, I later did meet Julius and work with him when I was at the Coffin House. And he would always give your father full praise and pretty much give him credit for starting his career. Yeah, the way it worked was... Um, uh, so, of course, I grew up with Julius, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then as he became older, uh, kept in touch with him. And then when the Neutra VDL studio and residences started to need repairs and Cal Poly didn't know what to do about it, uh, we started trying to find ways to fundraise, and Tony Greenberg came out I, you sort of came out of the woodwork, uh, Tony, but uh, very welcomingly and, and suggested, why don't we go up to Julius and get him to allow us to print a number of copies of the photo he took of my dad sitting uh, next to, uh, on the deck of the top of VDL looking out at the water roof. And so we went up and saw Julius and he was willing to do that. And then we went up another time and, and uh, we, he signed them all for us, and then we sold them for two thousand dollars to support the restoration. So he was um, very nice that way, and and uh, he uh, had been sort of an amateur photographer, and was a friend of a now forgotten Neutra draftsman who was living in an apartment above Julius's sister's uh, pharmacy in Silver Lake. Huh. And, um, and the guy said, you know, we just finished this building. You ought to come and see it. And, and Julius took a really nicely composed photograph of it and showed it after it was developed to the draftsman. And the draftsman said, hey, you got to show this to the boss. He's really going to like this. And so Julius came over, and my father was very enthusiastic and said, you know, uh, Rafael Soriano has just completed a thing. You ought to go, I'll, I'll call up Rafael and introduce you. You go over and see Rafael and take a photo of his stuff. And then from then on, my father was using Julius, and, and Rafael did, and then Gregory Ayn did, and, and that, Franklin, that was... Right? Uh, I, well, I don't think right in the in the early '30s was Not he doing. Early, he no. was wasn't doing an awful lot in Los Angeles, but and I don't know. Did did Julius do any uh, uh, right houses? Did he take some right photography? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the textile houses. Yeah. Didn't uh, Julius sure. later live in a house designed by by Raphael? Raphael. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah. his his yeah. life yeah. was his, his yeah. life was saved by. The fact that this was a steel house and there was a big um, uh, landslide after a big rain that collapsed part of the house and he he he, he broke his leg but he he wasn't yeah. uh, killed yeah. by this thing. So, did the acknowledgement ever go the other direction? Did your father ever um, say how influential Julius Schulman Schulman was in making yeah, his work? Yeah, and he wrote introductions to, to one of one one of, uh, of uh, Julius's books on photography mm -hmm. and um, wrote an appreciative introduction to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So your father coined the term biorealism, um, and he. A collection of his essays was called Nature Near. Right. So he's really taking influence from Frank Lloyd Wright's principles of organic architecture and then making them his own and interpreting them in his own way. Um, and then, of course, writing his book Survival Through Design. So can you talk a little bit about some of the, the ways that his architecture was organic or in your uh, view of that, how was his architecture organic? So you have the same, many of the same tactics of fitting into the landscape um, uh, and the long horizontal lines and, and so forth. Um, and I think the, uh, one of the differences was that he was, he came to the United States enthusiastic about 
Henry Ford, and he thought that if Henry Ford could make automobiles affordable for everybody, couldn't we use this for schools and for hospitals and for houses? And then you have to, so I was at um, Kentuck Knob today, magnificent house, but you can't have people hand preparing little dentate things all along the thing that, so his challenge <coughs> was to have a, a, a kind of simplicity that would be appropriate for prefabrication and yet uh, still uh, relate to nature. And so there's a lot less going on in the inside of a Neutra interior uh, than in a right interior. And you have less mullions and you, the, the, um, the star of the show is really what is outside the building. Um, because even in a prefabricated thing that, that works if you pay attention uh, to the landscape. And he had had some training in landscape architecture. His first assignment was a forest cemetery in, in Germany where he selected all the trees and shrubs and anticipated how they would have to be repair, re, replaced 50 years on and, and, and what have you. So um, people have said it's the machine in the garden uh, mm. kind of thing. And, and the uh, Kaufman House uh, then is, he says it's almost as if you went to the moon. That, that you would import a kind of nature that is what we need, um, and uh, it isn't grown out of the out of the ground, but it's sensitively placed there. So that's where the cheap and thin comes in, because um, in in order to be affordable, then it has to not be so massive, and or so handcrafted, or so handcrafted, yeah. And so, interestingly, the last project of the Neutra practice, which was continued by my brother, uh, I saw a month ago in Tarragona, Spain. And the lead architect of the Quetal Furniture and Pavilion Company in Tarragona reached out to my brother and said, we really like the penthouse on top of the VDL studio and residence. Couldn't we make that into a pavilion? But th this is a timber structure, and, and our thing has to be demountable and, and sent off someplace and then reassembled so it would be all in aluminum, uh, aluminum and glass, and then the materials would be uh, very light materials that would be stick, interior materials would be uh, stuck on with magnets onto this thing and the whole thing can be bundled and sent off and and then we will reassemble it for rich people and the the pool that's there and the deck and, and the, the, there will be wood but it'll be reclaimed wood that will be on the outside and so uh, but it needs to be a little larger and it needs to have a bathroom in it and so my brother was interacting with them as they designed this thing and the other day I was reading Survival Through Design and there's a chapter about the relationship between the folks that actually manufacture architecture and the guys back in the office who draw the plans. And that it used to be that the master builder was out there and supervising what was going on, but now there's this gap and, and you communicate with these people with specifications and plans and the guys are out in the rain and the mud and sort of cursing the damn architect and his white collar and comfort back in the office. But when you have prefabrication and everybody's under the same roof, then you have an interaction. And in fact, they told they introduced me to the guy who is their, their mechanical guy who has a high school education, but he's a genius for figuring out exactly how the thing works in their prototyping 
thing. And so it was just like my dad was imagining. Mm. So this thing is now available for you to buy, probably for a couple hundred thousand dollars. Mm. And they told me that they're for, that, and they have it all mounted now in a garden next to their factory. And they took us through the whole factory that makes other pavilions that they either sell to wealthy Saudi Arabians or to Google or Apple who have a landscape, office landscape, and every once in a while they didn't anticipate they needed a quiet room, and so this prefabricated thing is put in there and is this beautiful thing. And then he told me that every five years they accumulate all the, the comments that they have and then they put out a new a new uh, model that uh, reflects what they have learned about how it was used before. So it's just the kind of thing that my dad would have loved because he was kind of on the boundary. The, the model was almost industrial design, sure. although because of where he was working, he he did these one-off buildings just like Mr. Wright did. Yeah. But he was aiming towards steady Im improvement. So then he's getting very interested in not only the what people notice but also these physiological effects that they don't notice and there's um, we're republishing survival through design and so every new chapter that the guy in Taiwan is is doing he sends to me and Barbara Lamprecht and our board member Dr. Jim Wise who's an environmental psychologist and we give him comments and the and the last one he sent is actually one of the chapters that really caught my attention there was a guy named J.B. Harmon Dr. J.B. Harmon who did a study of 160,000 Texas school children and he was really worried about the illumination in classrooms and that if you have a glaring thing, kids sort of scrunch up. And when they scrunch up, there are all kinds of consequences to this that are not visual consequences, but stress and, and nutritional impacts and because of all this tight muscles and stuff like that, school performance. And, and so there was a classic example of what have amounted to the epidemiology of uh, of light uh, illumination exposure and my dad in the chapter talks about that this guy is pointing out that you know this is a visual input but there are all kinds of other consequences to this that you would never have imagined and that that um, and so that was one of the things that sort of influence mm -hmm. influence me. So I think that biorealism is partly about paying attention to what it is that nature does. And in, the, and in our tour today, the tour guide was opening the window and getting us to notice how much more we were hearing the creek gurgling by than when it was closed. And, and these are, um, there's you smell stuff, you, you have a temperature effect like you do over there where the, the cool air comes off the mm -hmm. thing. All these things that both my father and Mr. Wright were noticing and, and any sensitive architect would notice that you don't catch, your, catch on Julius Schumann's photograph, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that this had physiological effects and that it would be important to pay attention to that. Um, I love that your dad called um, architectural spaces sensoriums. I think we were talking about that earlier because they do engage all of your senses. And right. Amplify the experience of place. Right. And so you have an impact through what you perceive and then of course there are off-gassing chemicals and there's um, uh, other ways that this environment you have to pay attention to. We, mm -hmm. Peggy and I went and had a wonderful tour in Annalisa too with the director of the Phipps uh, um, um, Botanical Gardens and 
all the factors that they've paid attention to and using only materials that don't have off-gassing uh, chemicals and, and paying attention to what they're feeding the kids who come to visit this thing and what uh, reducing all the waste that uh, uh, disposable cups and plates and so forth so that there's this comprehensive commitment to the design of these environments and the processes inside of them. So uh, you mentioned the Institute. Mm -hmm. This is something that my dad started in 1962, about the time I was a medical student. We were talking about what he hoped for this. And he thought that somehow his brand would atta attract enough money that they would be able to support people that were doing this kind of design-related research. And that really didn't pan out. Uh, and when he died in 1970, then my brother took it over, and it became much more about uh, preserving the historic legacy and particularly the buildings. Um, and then as he got into his 90s, he asked me to join the board, which was mostly family members. Uh, and I suggested that we reintroduce the original mission as, as a dual mission. One of them is the preserving and sharing of this legacy. And the other is somehow using this brand to be supportive of all the people that are doing this kind of mm -hmm. stuff now. That they're people who are studying neuroesthetics, they're people doing environmental psychology, there's people, building science people that are interested in natural ventilation and, and CO2 levels and performance. There's phenomenologists that are thinking about this. There are human factor people that are thinking about the ergonomics. And all of them are in silos and all of them are publishing in their respective <laughs> publications and most of them don't know much of what the other ones are doing. And so, uh, but then my brother died and he left us three Neutra design apartments in the Silver Lake area of uh, LA. And one of the apartments has the old Neutra Alexander drafting room. So it's a place where about 100 people can get together for educational events. And, uh, and then he left us an endowment of about $3 million. So that sounds like a lot. Uh, we're in much better shape than many historic buildings because there is a flow of income, at least to maintain it. Um, but it's not enough to be, be a Ford Foundation where we're giving big grants to people. And it's not enough to really have much in the way of a paid staff. Um, and so we've been very lucky with a very active board where essentially we're divvy up the roles of an executive director. And so unlike the typical house museum, we have another task uh, because we have the in intellectual rights for things that are in the UCLA archive and the Cal Poly archive and now in the UC Santa Barbara archive. And so we have a responsibility to try to help those overwhelmed, underfunded archives to see that things get um, cataloged and certain things get digitized so they become widely available. And then we have the rights to uh, um, out-of-date publications. And so uh, we have a responsibility for doing that. And so this is preservation about the past. And then what about this other goal of using the Neutra legacy to promote and endorse today's people that are doing stuff? Well, one of the things that we've done is use the space uh, in one of the places where my brother had lived that was a multi-generational design to use the kids' wing uh, to offer to architecture uh, master students at USC to be able to stay there f during their ac last academic year. And then, of course, we have someone in the space 
making sure that it's not just sitting empty. And then in the other part of that building, there's a wonderful master bedroom, and we've in, invited people who are interested in this kind of stuff to come, and stay there and lecture in the other space. And so, for example, Dr. Esther Sternberg, uh, who has written the book Well at Work, based on her research in a number of government buildings, where she did the before and after studies and looked at stress hormones and sleep patterns and all kinds of physiological responsibilities to a better design and showed very robust effects, just like J.B. Harmon did back in the 40s, using other much more sophisticated endpoints. And so she came and stayed and then uh, we programmed a, a seminar uh, which we co-sponsored with a local AIA and we had about a hundred people there. And then we had the Dean of the School of Public Health and one of the professors of building science and someone from Art Center Design be discussants and then led discussions of the people who were there about what are we going to do to overcome the fact that developers willy-nilly have the responsibility to, to be economic in the construction of such places and they don't have, they don't share any of the costs of the people who will be living there for 50 years or working there for 50 years where their effects on performance and well-being and so forth. So how do we um, find clients like the Kaufmans, they care about mm -hmm. what's being built. And, and there are examples like the guys at the Phipps who he was relentless in getting the architects to make sure that there was no off-gassing, that, that they used every degree to be energy efficient and so forth. So we had discussions about that. So that's part of the way of using our built legacy to do this and then we've made it available to other organizations that are doing interesting things so the journalist uh, uh, Francis Anderton and another uh, cooperating organization called Fort LA for Los Angeles residential treasures have had a series of seminars and trails about exemplary apartment houses and uh, um, affordable uh, dwellings. So we offered the space and we're billed as co-sponsored appropriately and, and they do all the programming. So that's one thing that we're doing. Then the other thing is that there's some organizations that have a platform. For example, San Francisco AIA has webinars and we, they came to us and say, will you pro help us program around this kind of thing? And so we've done things with, with them. And I've just been talking to Mark and William about cooperating with Palm Springs Modernism to do some programs with this kind of theme. And they have, how many people come every year? 130, uh, only 130,000 people. Now Over they won't. They, they, <laughs> they won't. They won't all come to our thing, but many people will. And, and um, so, anyway, this this is the challenge that we now have to find partners with with platforms, and to find partners who say, you know, it would be helpful to what I'm doing to be affiliated with your brand. And so another thing that we've been doing, um, on Thursday I'll be meeting with the head of Perkins Eastman Environmental Psychology Unit, and they volunteered to go to Los Angeles and do a post-occupancy evaluation of the thermal and ventilational performance of the UCLA lab school. It was yeah. an indoor-outdoor school that was designed in 1958. Um, uh, um, and um, they do this kind of thing with their own schools. They feel passionate about the utility of doing that, but to do it on a Neutra designed school sort of gets extra attention to the methodology, and of course, to them as good guys to do it. And 
they're now trying to get into South by Southwest to make another presentation of, of what they've done. And the name Neutra on it sort of increases the probability that all the people who go to South by Southwest will get uh, um, a good dose of post-occupancy evaluation. So um, that's what we're, what we're doing. And uh, here I am, 85 years old, and I'm meeting all these fantastic, energetic, committed people, just like the people I grew up with, so. <laughs> Keeps you young. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so you spent a day in Frank Lloyd Wright architecture. Any takeaways from Kentuck Knob or Falling Water? Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, I had forgotten how ingenious Wright was with the mechanical side of his mm -hmm. things, like these, these windows that open up at the corner. So no wonder that Kaufman wanted to have the same thing in. And um, the, on the one hand, the simplicity of it, like in Tuck Knob, but also how, it, in, in terms of the craftsmanship that go into this, extremely expensive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet, some of these same principles uh, can be used by a guy like my dad to uh, do it uh, for a prefabricated kind of thing that uh, that works and um, all this wonderful linkage to the rocks on the on the place and so forth is just spectacular. Is there a work of your father's that you kind of place at the at the top? Well, you know, people always point to the Kaufman Desert House, which is, mm -hmm. is certainly there. But this little reunion house that, that we inherited from Dion is, uh, is contemporary with a Neutra case study house and really is a case study house in the sense that it was not built for any particular person but was a spec house. And there's a right connection to that too, that Walter Johnson uh, grandfather had a turn of the century right summer house somewhere up in Wisconsin and he grew up with this and he came out to Los Angeles and he knew there was all this construction going on and he thought that I would like to do a spec house and I'd like to get Wright to do one and for some reason Wright was unable to do it and whether he referred um, uh, Walter to my dad, or whether Walter knew about my dad, he came and said, um, I noticed that you own a piece of property in Silver Lake, which was true, that the Department of Water and Power had a whole strip of land next to the Silver Lake Reservoir that they decided to unload. And my dad and his Danish friend from Puerto Rico times, when he'd been down there, uh, decided to buy up this land and they would only sell it to people who would let my dad design a house on it. So there's 11 of those Neutra houses there that eventually got built. And, and uh, two of them had been built and then Walter Johnson came and said, I would like to do this and I would like to be the contractor. And so they talked about it and my dad said, well, okay, let's make up a story. This is going to be the reunion house. Grandma and Grandpa uh, are going to uh, live in the master bedroom and it will have its own bathroom and it'll be designed in such a way that there's a door into the shower and there's a door into the toilet and then there's two sinks. So Grandma can be on the pot and Grandpa can be shaving there. And then when they have guests, they can come and use that, that place. And then at the far end of the house, there's going to be a glass window into the kitchen and a, and a, and a glass panel above the door that will close. And beyond the kitchen, there'll be two little bedrooms and there'll be two exits from there. So various children can come with a grandchild and visit grandma and grandpa and they can come and go in their own way and, uh, and uh, 
then grandma and grandpa will be able, when it gets a little too much, to retreat to this bedroom. And the bedroom has a write-in uh, mitered glass window and a what my dad called a spider leg where where there's a beam that goes out and in, 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 in on a post outside the envelope of the building so this guides your eye out and makes this a very and there'll be a nice desk for grandma and grandpa and uh, it'll all work in and so it's called reunion house well this was very typical for my dad to try if he didn't have a client then he would imagine a client <laughs> and then he would build it and he did the same thing for the three case study houses that he designed and only one of them was built but this was being built exactly the same time and um, it's a really beautiful hmm. very simple um, house with not much of a view. It's a very intimate patio view in, into a hedge. It's very private. And so that's where uh, it, it happened that when there was a fire at the VDL studio residence, suddenly my parents needed a place to be. And it turned out that this house had come on the market. So they bought it. And they lived it for a few years. And my brother lived in another part of the VDL. And his wife didn't want to be in the VDL, so the, my parents decided to move back and sold it to my brother. And um, he lived there from 1963 till when he died in, in 2019. And, and both of them were in hospital, hospital beds. Both of them had, she had a neurological condition and he had a couple of different kinds of cancers. And they were in hospital beds looking out into this beautiful, uh, patio so there there it's used in even another way so it's gone through all this this uh, life and now the USC student is there and the occasional professor that comes and, and talks is there and um, uh, it, it continues so it's quite a special place and then Really, I've come to appreciate the VDL studio and residence because it's on a 60 by 70 foot lot. It has accommodated multiple households and a workspace all in, in one place. And um, uh, at the second level, it, just like here, it has access to the outside. Uh, and yet it's a miniature, it's really really small and it was very experimental in the materials it was used at the time and then again in, in 1963 and you get to see the progression of the architecture. Uh, people don't talk enough about how architects learn something and the, of course there's just no question in my mind that the later houses are better than the Lovell Health House. Mm. He mm -hmm. learned a lot of stuff along the way. Mm -hmm. And particularly since he, he thought that it was kind of like industrial design, that it wasn't completely new every time, but was some variation in the incremental improvement. So, Did you ever experience your dad's inter interaction with clients? How did he interact with his clients? You know, and it, with sight, too. It, um, he, um, I, I think uh, earlier on in his career, there were some episodes of friction with, mm -hmm. with clients. Mm -hmm. um, maybe partly because he was insecure and mm -hmm. partly because people didn't know exactly what they were signing up for. By the time, mm -hmm. later in his career, People knew what they were signing up for, and they were on board. And, and uh, people have commented about mid-century modern, oh, it's so wonderful, and it's come back into vogue. Well, it, it's come back, it, it originally was for a very thin slice of the market. Mm -hmm. and, and I tend to think of my dad's work as outside-in mm -hmm. architecture. Mm -hmm not so much inside out. And not everybody wants to have all much, that much of inside. And we were talking about Kentuck Knob and how Wright said, you know, don't 
go up there with this giant thing, it will be overwhelm you. Well, probably my dad would have built it there, mm -hmm. partly because they wanted it there, but a, a lot of his houses have these incredible views. There's one looking over the Jungfrau that with you know two stories of glass looking at down the valley mm -hmm. at, at this thing. So, uh, but siding was very important for him. I, aren't there stories of him taking airplane flights in the middle of the night just to see how the moonlight would reflect off the architecture, or going into the woods with the clients to find the spiritual energy of the forest and things <laughs> like that? Uh, I'd, I'd never heard the airplane part, but but, but, <laughs> he, cer but he certainly, <laughs> but but certainly he would go and 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 get a sense of what was going on and think about different. But nature was always paramount. Uh, finding that part of the, the site. Nature was really important to um, to bring in, and um, so um, I got diverted here. What was I saying? That, um, yeah, that, that mid-century modern, and of course right, uh, is not everybody has bought in to biophilia, really. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you were saying that many people like Kentucky Knob more than than this place, and this is much more, nature is much more evident here, and this is a more radical uh, um, a departure from what people are used to than the Usonian houses with their hip roofs, and it's not quite as different. And, uh, but somehow in apartment design, people are more willing to do it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm although we have plenty of Spanish Revival apartments. And, but even then, they, they have more balconies and, mm -hmm. and access to, to nature. So um, um, uh, the, the revival of mid-century modern still hasn't uh, permeated particularly to, to single-family dwelling. And it's not clear whether, you know, just are there really good market surveys to know that if you do a Eichler type of house, you just can't sell as many? Hmm. Um, but if you uh, put a pitch roof on it, maybe then you can have a little bit more nature into it, but you have to um, relate to what people are used to. Hmm. Yeah. Just, um, I mean, it is amazing that the two of the most emblematic houses in the world was Edgar Kaufman and Lillian Kaufman. So Falling Water and, and the Desert House. But yet, he chose Frank Lloyd Wright for this, but he did not choose Frank Lloyd Wright for the desert. But didn't Frank Lloyd Wright also design a house for, I mean, it's just, I, I'm, I'm wondering how that came about, why he wouldn't have gone with Frank Lloyd Wright, or did he even ask? And, um, and, and I thought it was a myth, but, I, saw plans for the mm -hmm. Boulder House. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a long yeah, And that, that was for Lillian, right? For Lillian yeah. in 1950. And so I just yeah. wondered during that time period, I mean, how could, I mean, here's a Neutra sitting inside of Falling Water, but I don't think of, of Frank Lloyd Wright would be sitting inside of a Neutra. You know, the, I don't know that <laughs> he would have the same, <laughs> the same uh, you know, perspective of everything. Yeah, we, no yeah, one we seems were, to. No, yeah, we were, we were debating that same topic, Mark, earlier today. <laughs> Um, and, you know, Edgar Kaufman was a visionary. He was also a great retailer and used his architecture to promote the family business. Mm -hmm. So promoting lifestyle brand through architecture. Um, I think giving Frank Lloyd Wright a chance to create this house propelled not just Frank Lloyd Wright's career, but also gave a great name to the Kaufman's department store. Uh -huh. They had long association in Palm Springs. They had been vac vacationing there since the 20s, all through the 30s. And I think they probably knew of Neutra, obviously. Uh, and they were always trying to get their feet into different parts of society, Hollywood included, and all that whole Palm Springs culture. Um, so I think Edgar Kaufman Sr. was looking for the next <coughs> new 
thing to promote a lifestyle brand post-war era, and Neutra was kind of leading the way. Um, and then that house became the symbol for post-war California living, right? Um, and the Julia Schulman photographs sealed the deal. Um, so I think that's, pro but we, both of us need to do a little bit more homework to see if we can dig and find if there's correspondence that tells a direct but reason the for the connection. The boulders, was that <laughs> so, by request, or was it so, just, yeah, so I'm going to show you something I can do. And Frank Lloyd Wright was very miffed that Neutra mm -hmm. was chosen to do the house. Okay. And it about destroyed their relationship, because Kaufman had been a lifetime patron um, from this house on. Um, until he died. Uh, and it was really the Edgar Kaufman Jr. kind of came in to try and help fix the relationship. And at that point in time, Edgar Kaufman Sr. and Lillian's relationship was deteriorating because of extramarital affair, um, which had been a problem all through their marriage. Um, so Jr. and Lillian kind of went to Wright and said, can we kind of try and heal the family? through another work of Frank Lloyd Wright architecture, um, because Falling Water had always been the place where the family could come together in nature and put aside all of the familial issues. Um, so they commissioned the Boulder House in 1950 for Lillian, so there was gonna be a his and hers house in Palm Springs. <laughs> so Edgar Kaufman <coughs> would keep the Neutra House and Lillian would have the Frank Lloyd Wright Boulder House. Um, never materialized, of course. Um, and then, of course, there's a tragic ending, which we don't need to bring into the story tonight. But yeah, that was an attempt at healing the, the family dynamic through architecture. Wow. Yeah. Um, I have a story about uh, Neutra and Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, I was actually friends with Beth and Ben Harris, who restored the Hawkman House. And as it turned out, they needed somebody to house manage. I'm a landscape architect. So in order to get me down there and do what they wanted me to do, they said, we have a plot of land for you to go ahead and do the landscape on. So while we were programming the design of this particular piece of land, they said, here are three cacti that we have boxed up. Integrate them into your new design and just protect them, protect them, protect them. So I said, OK. And we did that, and the cactus were fine, and then we planted them in the new garden, and when Beth and Brent were walking around the garden, very pleased with what I had done, they said, well, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright gave those to the Coffins because after he saw the house, he realized he had behaved very badly, and this was his makeup gift uh, to them. And I was like, thank God they didn't tell me that ahead of time. I, <laughs> I would have been out there 24 hours a day <laughs> protecting them. <laughs> but they were on a, a Choya cactus, which are like the most prickly, dangerous, <laughs> feisty cactus ever. They practically wrote thorns at you. But I love that, because it was, and they're still there. There's two out of three still living. So, so I you're still prickly, you know what to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was asking uh, Justin whether uh, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright accepted as much kibitzing from, from um, the Kaufmans as my father did. Because I found it tended to be as, as differential, uh, deferential as he could be as long as uh, things that he felt were essential uh, were not compromised. Uh, the, he designed, for example, a house in, in Cuba for a Swiss banker. And I met with the fellow who had been the young uh, Cuban architect that was the supervising architect. And he told me um, that he was really surprised because my f father was there under construction and then the um, the owner wanted to have a um, a more ample uh, balcony, and uh, my father figured out a way to do that. I think he eliminated a a flower box and just went. They had a, a flower box worth of further uh, 
um, stuff, and he he was sort of impressed how deferential my dad was on that, while still defending the facade of the of the house. So he spent a lot of time and assigned poor old Thad Longstreet to every morning talk for an hour or two to Edgar and try to see what he could accommodate in and report on things that they figured that they weren't going to accommodate. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know whether that, when you look at the correspondence, do you see that amount of kibitzing? Oh, there's kibitzing? tons of back and forth. There is, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. Does anybody have questions or comments? I had a question about this property. Yeah. yeah. Um, there used to be a summer camp here for yes. Hoffman's employees, right? Yes. Yeah. When did that go away? Or was it before this so was built? Or yeah, it? so it was a Victorian era summer camp that was built here by a group of Masons from Pittsburgh. Um, and the Kaufmans discovered that camp and started leasing it from the Masons as a fresh air camp outside of Pittsburgh for the employees of the department store. Um, and they operated the camp up until the depression and then the camp kind of shut down mm. and then that's when the Kaufmans purchased the entire camp and then started entertaining the idea of a vacation, personal vacation house uh, for themselves here at the landscape that they had kind of come to love by being out here with the employees of the store. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And of course the falls that. was always the center oh, yeah. of, of the activity for the camp for bathing, for sun bathing, for picnicking. So. That's where they wanted the house, or at least somewhere around the falls. Of course, they anticipated looking at the falls, not living over top of the falls. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And for many years, I remember the oral history was that the sun was the one that yes. was instrumental to get Frank Lloyd Wright hired exactly. by dad. Exactly. So he might have had some influence with the transition to Palm Springs. Uh, and then again later to bring yeah. the family together with the with the sure. Lillian house. With Lillian's house, yeah, sure. So I think he's, ha he's got a Oh, he's definitely, uh, the three of them together are intertwined in all yeah. of the architecture they created, no question. Yep. I know you live in a Neutra house. What's it like yeah, to yeah. live in a Neutra house? It's, well, it was, it's different, you know. It's the, the different house and the neighborhood. So tell us which house it is. It's uh, the Frazier house, and which it's is in Uniontown. Um, I've had that since, uh, well, 10 years now. And when I saw it for sale, I, I just couldn't, I, I couldn't pass it up. I was living in Greene County. And I was moving back to Fayette County because I was retiring from work. And I thought, you know, this is it. My son, actually, he saw it and he told me. He called and told me and he lives down towards Pittsburgh. So that's, that's his legacy. That's what I'm <laughs> telling him. But, um, and it's all one floor, um, you know, three bedrooms. Uh, the one strange thing about it is it has a den, a very small den. It's very tiny and has a fireplace in this small room, which never use the fireplace because huh. if you're going to sit in there, you're just going to bake. <laughs> I mean, it's, that didn't seem, you know, huh. like something, you know, I'm like hot all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you see me over here, right? <laughs> but um, I just love it. Um, I, I didn't make, you know, many changes. Um, carpeting, like I said, um, you know, update the toilets and the, the, uh, replace the countertop. She must like cooking a lot because there was a <laughs> lot of burned areas <laughs> that she had taken something off the stove and then, you know, put it on the counter. But it was a very beautiful blue mm, with mm -hmm, mm -hmm. burn marks. <laughs> yeah, I just enjoy it, and I, I don't take it for granted um, that I live there, and and that's something my son has an interest in, new projects as well. 
So, I mean, that he lives down towards Pittsburgh, but it, and it'll be his one day. Hmm. How is the experience Probably. of living there different from the experience of living in a more typical house? Yeah. A little bit more pep in my step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. But like, this is mine. <laughs> and I hadn't even moved in, but I had someone doing some work for me. And take out the crunchy carpet, you know, I wasn't going to move <laughs> put furniture in there and he said oh yeah this this man he stopped by here's his phone number I mean there's still people that I mean I got a request probably three months ago to buy my house mm, I'm sure yeah, yeah. and you know I, I just you know I'm not going to sell it I'm, that's my <laughs> I, and I say that's I mean it's my home yeah you know it's not for sale is there much land with it? No. No, it's in this, it's like just a typical, it's in Uniontown, it's just a rectangular. Mm -hmm. Suburban lot. Right. Yeah. And then the house, you know, is big. I mean, it's pretty big, so it's long. So it takes up a good bit of that space. But one thing that I guess your, your father, I told them to plant a lot of trees on that property. Well, I had found out from someone else that uh, it was the realtor said that they had previously taken out a l some of the trees because there was at one time 70 trees on a, like a typical lot. Yeah. Awesome. So th things are still growing up, you know, so really if you go past my house, you, you can't really see it, you know, unless, you, you know, because it uh, sits on an intersection there because of, you know, the greenery, you know, sh you know, shrubs and things like that. And um, I've had people, like I said, stop by and I just don't feel comfortable with letting people know. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Do, uh, does it um, have sliding doors or is there a patio or a, is there a link to the outdoors at all? There is, um, the front door never used. It's facing one street. Um, Rarely any, no one comes there, you know. If they do come there, they don't know I, why you're there, you know. So, but off the kitchen is a screened-in porch, which I, I spend a, long, a lot of time out there. You know, I have it. And my dog likes it out there, too, mm -hmm. you know. So. <laughs> but, and, and then the back, off of the, the actual living room is... I mean, there are panels of eight doors. Four, you know, move, and the other are just stationary. But then that has a back porch on it. Um, I don't spend much time out there. I like to put the screen in porch. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know how it came to be designed there? Because he was essentially the West Coast. Well, focus. Um, the Pre Mrs. Preacher, I know for sure, was friends with Mrs. Kaufman. So that was the connection. Mm -hmm. Are there others in the Union Town? No, that's oh, the, no. Just the, the only one. one. Yeah. There, there's some so around uh, Philadelphia. Yeah. So that must have been right. the reason why they good. had that connection. And mm -hmm. I figure, without even anyone telling me that, that, yeah. that yeah. was the the connection. And that connection there. What year was that? Do you know? What uh, year was it? 50, 50 something? 50, right? 1950. I'm not sure. Yeah. What, what did you do before you retired? Uh, I worked at a bank. I, I worked in a different county. I worked in Greene County. Actually, I was tour guide here. Uh huh. <laughs> in, the, in the 70s, latter 70s, uh -huh. when I graduated from. High school, I I knew a woman and her daughter worked up here, and she called me up one day and she says, "Oh, and I was in a, a Rainbow Girls, uh -huh. you know, I was a Rainbow Girl." And so my mother advisor, she said, "We need tour guides at Falling Water," and I had, you know, a lot of speaking roles in that organization. So I said, "Okay," she said, "Just come up and just go on a tour." You know, see how you like it, and really, it was the best job I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 
It's more fun than banking. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed it. I love coming here every day, you know, that I did work here. And when I, you know, when my son told me about the house, the Northrop house for sale, I'm like, it's going to be mine. <laughs> yeah. That's great. And I still have people that leave notes at the door. I'm sure, mm-hmm. yeah. That's great. I do. Yeah. Well, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright always anticipated that people would want, would want to tour his architecture. Mm-hmm. So he would give the owners of the houses instructions on how to operate tours and <laughs> how much to charge. So. <coughs> Mrs. Preezer, Gertrude, what's her name? Um, and Mrs. Kaufman, were friends. Yeah. Any it's other nothing, questions? You know, I don't have a stream. <laughs> well, I mean, you mentioned the house puts more pep in your step, so it's serving its purpose of improving your health and well-being. Oh, and yes. I just so love it. And my son, I mean, he lives down toward Pittsburgh, but I, I don't see him keeping it. It'll be for sale one day. Huh. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I see your work as being about the, the science of the experience of the house, mm-hmm. in a way. Mm-hmm. Are there homes um, that have, or other buildings that have been constructed uh, that may have been inspired by your father's work that uh, somehow um, ring true to you because of your specific areas of uh, interest? You must see buildings and love them and then tie them back to your own work. Well, I think a lot, uh, one of the interesting things in my father's career is when he started out, there weren't many people doing that particular Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Uh, And what he was aiming for uh, was easily adopted by other people. It's not so easy for someone else to do a Frank Lloyd Wright, but it... Mm -hmm. Um, so Eichler homes and so forth. Uh, um, um, by the end of the career, it wasn't so special, right? But that wasn't the wasn't the point. Was um, so there are a lot of I think Ray Cappy's architecture sure. is beautiful and um, I knew his son Finn back in the day. Mm. And Ray Cappy's son. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, okay. LA Right, I, I yeah. So um, <laughs> there, and someone was talking about Artigas in in Mexico, who I think acknowledged his mm-hmm. his um, mm-hmm. affinity for for that. And then there, are, um, Brazilian architects also, and mm-hmm. and then there are architects. Uh, in Africa now, who are they don't look like Neutra, but the, the spirit is the, the is the same. The, the principles, principles are the same, yeah. and the if you like the performance criteria are are the same. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I have a question. Yeah, uh, Mr. Neutra, you have such a an eclectic range of experiences mm-hmm. growing up. I'm really curious. Did that, how did that affect your path in life? Well, um, I talked a little bit about the experience of all these theosophists and, and Buddhists and so forth uh, uh, influenced the, the way I conducted myself as, as I did things. Um, I realize, actually, um, that um, a lot of the people who were willing to do these unusual things and design unusual things made the assumption that you could design, right? That you could plan, and that you could plan on a scale that is larger than... uh, Not everybody ag- agrees to that, and we're at, at this moment in an election where um, the idea that you could 
do city planning or you could do a, a larger scale social planning is is a big mistake yeah. and uh, and that you could uh, uh, go in a new direction that was not traditional so we have under the last administration we had an architectural I forget what they called them but trying to get all government mm -hmm. buildings to Classical. look like Greek yeah. temples yeah. again yeah. Now some of you are shaking your uh, head with that, but then people, there's some people who say, look, this was crazy. This was a, this whole direction mm -hmm. uh, was just uh, a, an example of uh, society going off, going off the rail. So that, um, And the people saying that, some of them are very thoughtful people too, right? So um, uh, this is all quite, uh, you know, it was controversial then, but now people are having second thoughts about it and, mm -hmm. and saying that, mm -hmm. you know, this place needs a few Doric columns on it and mm -hmm. we'd feel mm -hmm. a lot better. And, and it's related to that thing of the market analysis of what people will buy uh, is, and, and that Kentuck knob doesn't push the envelope as much as this does, you could imagine that some of the benefits of this kind of architecture, my dad's kind of architecture, could be accomplished uh, uh, looking more traditional. And, and, and I'm enough of a results-based kind of person that I'm willing to think about that. Mm -hmm. um, um, Clearly, if you want to build everything to look like Abe Lincoln's cabin, then you can't do that. You know, if you and actually, my dad did design one house in Montana that was a log cabin. <laughs> for, um, but it, of course, it didn't look like Abe, Abe Lincoln's cabin. Mm. <laughs> but it had logs in the walls, right, and a, a sod roof. Yeah, Peggy has a question for me. No, I have a comment for you. <laughs> so I'm Raymond's wife, Peggy, Hi. and uh, I wanted to tell you a little story. Raymond and I were at a boarding school together, age 9 through 12, in Ohio, and we used to um, um, carpool together to his home on Silver Lake Boulevard. My parents would be going in that direction, and Raymond and I would be summer vacation or holiday or Easter or whatever. So at one point, we're in the car, we drive up to 2300 Silver Lake, is that right the number? 2300 Silver Lake Boulevard. And my stepfather, this is my granddaughter, she knows my uh, stepfather, Bill Proctor, who is also an architect, said, hey, remember this house. Remember this house. This is an extraordinary, historically big step in architecture house <laughs> on Silver Lake Boulevard. And I'm, you know, what, junior in high school, I care. <laughs> <laughs> but I never forgot the comment. This is a, his this, this, my stepfather said, who was an architect, as I said, this is an enormous step forward in architecture. So these things happen without our knowing. Stuff right now is, is happening and going on out there. But I thought I would just bring that up because, you know, we, we with our unbelievable ingenuity, in his father's case, that ingenuity of that completely step into a whole other kind of architecture, another kind of living, um, stuff's happening right right now. And we hope it's the right direction. I'm not going to go to politics. <laughs> um, but anyway, I just wanted to mention that story that that, uh, that wonderful stepfather of mine, the architect, remember this house. This is a step forward. I never I never forgot that. And Randall and I went like this in our lives. He married another other people. I married another person, her her grandpa. <laughs> and they passed away, and 
and here we are together. <laughs> Life is awesome. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, let's break for some wine and, and food, and we can continue the conversations uh, with Raymond and with Peggy um, and with each other um, over some, some good eats. So let's give Raymond a round of applause.